I'll be speaking to Hetty Epstein, a longtime human rights activist from the St. Louis area. She was arrested in August in St. Louis at the protests over the killing of Michael Brown. We're going to speak about the situation in the area now after the grand jury failed to indict the officer. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm okay. Were you surprised at the grand jury decision? Not really. I mean, being the eternal optimist, I was still hoping that there would be a different decision, but I really knew uh, that that's, he's not going to be found guilty. And when we it learned... was a given the way the prosecutor handled the case from the very beginning. It almost sounds like the prosecutor was putting Michael Brown on trial, asking about right. marijuana and all these other things. Right. I mean, this long talk that he gave last Monday after the decision came down from the uh, grand jury was really almost like he was uh, the defense attorney for... Uh, the, uh, the, what's his name, for Will, Darren Wilson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You live near Ferguson. Have you been there over the years? Oh, yeah, I've been there. I'm probably about 20 or 25 minutes by car from where I live. What it's kind a of, suburb of St. Louis. Uh -huh. What kind of a town is it? Uh, um, it's... It's really, you know, St. Louis has about 90 municipalities, uh, the, the greater St. Louis, I should say. And that's part of the problem because each one of these 90 little municipalities have their own police and their own fire department, and they can't afford to really completely, uh, uh, you know, populate that um department with enough personnel, and uh, what we need is to reduce the number of these municipalities so that each police department and each fire department has enough people to really uh, function the way they should. Mm. So what have you heard about the current protests? Well, I... The, that those were expected, and in fact, I hope they will continue because this issue, while it is Ferguson, it's really a national issue, a national issue of racism, and um, the, the, we cannot go back to the status quo. Changes have to take place, and the only way these changes are going to take place if the issue is constantly before the public, constantly before the institutions that control these uh, various areas. Um, because if, we, if the uh, protest doesn't continue, then, you know, people will go back to their comfortable situations and say, well, you know, it's all over and everything is fine now and everything is not fine. I heard that yesterday there was a long march that started from Ferguson to go to the state capitol. That's right. And it's going to take probably about a week for the people to get there. Mm -hmm. They're going to walk, uh, I forgot uh, uh, how many miles each day. I guess they walk about... 10 or 15 miles each day until they get to Jefferson, which is the seat of the state government of Missouri. Do, do you know the names of the groups or uh, any of the leaders? Well, there are different people participating mm -hmm. in, that, um, in that march. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a whole collection of things. Right. Um, I, I was uh, shocked to read, uh, well, I had heard that there had been arson, but then I... Uh, I read that the church that uh, Michael Brown's father attends was burned right. down. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of violence after the decision came down last, last Monday, and that was to be expected. Uh, but what was really, really unforgivable, uh, the um, National Guard and the police in Ferguson were... While all this looting and and the arson going on, we're in the white 
part of Ferguson, and the looting and the of arson took place in the African American part of Ferguson, and there was nobody there. They just let it burn. Yeah, I heard this on Amy Goodman on Democracy Now. Uh, same same charge. Um, and it's just unforgivable. And you know, and the governor had declared about a week before uh, uh, that this was a crisis situation and that we were prepared. And he was, I guess he was prepared to protect the white c part of the community. Mm. Let me go back and ask uh, you about your uh, situation in August. You were arrested. Could right. you talk about that? Well, um, I, there was a, a friend of mine called me and said, you know, there's going to be this uh, gathering downtown and we hope to talk to the governor. Uh, who has an office in one of the downtown uh, state uh, buildings. And so I went downtown, and I really, arrest was the furthest from my mind. I had not thought about arrest at all, you know, because I felt, you know, we have a right to assemble. We have a right of free speech. It may be curtailed already, but we still have some of it. And I, I wanted, we wanted to talk to the governor, and, and if he's not there, to his staff, uh, and ask him to de-escalate violence in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And that this was violence primarily on the part of the police. So and, then what happened? And uh, we uh, assembled downtown and walked about a block this building called the Wainwright Building, which is a state building. So what happened then? Uh, when we arrived at this building, and there's a little plaza in front of the building, uh, the police were blocking the doors. Police and security people were blocking the doors. And uh, we did not force our uh, entry. We just stood there. We wanted, to go, we, ended, we wanted to talk to the governor. And there was no response from the police. Uh, or the security people. And then some of the people assembled there, and we were probably about 200, told of their stories, what has happened to them in the past few days in Ferguson or wherever they were uh, demonstrating. And, uh, and then a police lieutenant arrived on the scene and told us the governor is not in his office, the staff is not in, his off in their office, and uh, we should disperse. And uh, we did not uh, disperse. And I could tell instantly how the electricity in the air was rising. The police straightened up some. And uh, the next thing, you know, somebody, a policeman, grabbed me by the arm and handcuffs were put on me and on eight other people who were near me. And we will walk to the nearby paddy wagon and take them to a nearby police substation. Our handcuffs were removed. We each were given, uh, asked to give personal information, your name, birth date, address, etc. And after all nine of us had given that information, we were given, each of us were given a, a pink slip. Uh, we, that doesn't mean we were fired, <laughs> but uh, we were. It, it, it told us that we were charged with uh, failure to disperse, and we have an October 21st uh, court date. And on October 21st, the city councilor uh, wisely uh, refused to take the matter, and so end of the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, I mean, with, uh, I, I forgot how long the statute of limitations is. It's probably a year. If we want to, we can bring a federal charge, uh, but I don't know that any one of us is going to do that. I'd like to ask you a bit about your background, uh, certainly far different than most uh, protesters. First, if I can ask you, what is your age? Ninety. Nine. In fact, I was arrested in August, three days after my 90th birthday. What, what a way to start your 91st <laughs> year. What a present. And, and you're from Germany and you were on the Kinder Transport? 
Right. I was born in Germany, and in May 1939, I left Germany on a kinder transport or a children's transport to England. England took in almost most or mostly Jewish uh, children, uh, about 10,000 of us, um, in the nine months preceding World War II, and would have taken more except the war broke out. And when I said goodbye to my parents and other family members, um, I remember my parents gave me all kinds of admonitions still, you know, to be good and honest, etc. And the last sentence always was, and we will see each other again soon. And I believed that. Whether my parents did, I don't really know. But that was the last time I saw my parents and other family members because they were subsequently deported and uh, perished in Auschwitz. Uh, I read that uh, you were involved in per doing research about doctors. Uh, right. Uh, what after was that? the war, after the war was over, I returned to Germany, and uh, I had a contract for one year to work for the U.S. Civil Censorship Division, censoring incoming and outgoing German mail. And that was really very boring, reading other people's mail. We were supposed to look for codes. I never found anything. I mean, nobody wrote, the next sentence is a code. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so if somebody wrote, Grandma's coming to visit us next weekend, maybe she really was going to come. Maybe that was a code. I don't know. And But at, before the year was up, my right, contractual year was up, I decided I wanted to stay longer in Germany, but not do this kind of work anymore. And I applied and was hired by the American government uh, to do research on the trial of the medical doc German Nazi doctors who performed medical experiments on concentration camp inmates. Uh, this was following this trial, as well as uh, 11 others, were fo followed the international trial, uh, which was uh, conducted by the United States, Great Britain, France, and the former Soviet Union. But b before that trial was over, the American government had decided to conduct 12 more trials in the same palace of justice in Nuremberg where the international trial took place. And so I was hired. and. I was assigned to the case of the Nazi doctors. And um, most of the time, I, or a good part of the time, I actually spent in Berlin in a former Nazi document center looking for the documentary evidence to be used by the prosecution uh, in this trial. Uh. And I, you know, it, it was a very rude awakening for me. I did not know that exper medical experiments had been conducted on concentration camp inmates. And the documents, some of the documents that we found, you know, gave gruesome details of how these experiments were conducted, what the reaction was of the people they experimented on. There were photographs at times showing, you know, the how people responded in the process of these experiments. It was just horrendous. I mean, I literally became physically ill at times, vomited, had nightmares. Wow. E even today, once in a while, I still have a nightmare about one or another of those experiments. When you were arrested in August, I saw you were wearing the shirt, Be Human. So that no, stay, stay human. Stay human, I'm sorry. So that brings up the whole question of Palestine. I, I read you became active around Israel and Palestine in 82, is that right? right? Right, Well, you know, it really goes back to my childhood. My parents were anti-Zionists. And as a young child, I didn't totally understand what Zionism or anti-Zionism is. But if my parents were anti-Zionists, then I was an anti-Zionist. And um, I, uh, when I came to this country, to the United States, in May 1948, which was about the same time that Israel became a state. And I remember having some conflicting feelings. 
on one hand, I was glad that there was a place for uh, survivors of the Holocaust to go to because maybe they could not or chose not to return to their place of origin. Uh, but on the other hand, I remembered my parents' ardent anti-Zionism, and I was afraid that somewhere down the road, no good was going to come of this. What that might be, I couldn't possibly imagine. But, you know, I was new in this country, new experiences and new things to learn, and so Israel and Palestine were on the back burner of my interests. And, uh, but I got a wake-up call in 1982, and I learned something about the massacres in the two refugee camps of Sapra and Chitila, located in uh, Lebanon. And I needed to find out what was this all about and who was responsible for it, who was adversely affected by it, and what happened between 1948 and 1982 when I paid little or no attention to that part of the world. And as I learned more and understood more, I became increasingly more disturbed about the policies and practices of the Israeli government vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people. Now, you've and been to the West Bank and Israel several times? Yes, I've been there five times. When was the first time? In uh, 2003. Mm-hmm. My God, that was... Uh, <laughs> and I've also made five failed attempts to go to Gaza. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, you tried to go by boat. By boat, and uh, also one time by land. And and uh, how do the Israelis uh, say that you have no right? You, a Jewish woman, a, a well, when I you know when I left uh, pa uh, Palestine the first time in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, at the airport in Tel Aviv, at the Ben Gurion Airport, I was detained for five hours. I was strip searched and internally searched. And when I asked why, I was told because you're a terrorist, because you're a security risk. They said you were a terrorist. Ter I'm a terrorist and a security risk. Incredible. Incredible. Yep. I've been reading that Palestinians are sending uh, computer messages to people in Ferguson, teaching right. them I how mean, to deal with tear gas and such. Right, especially, you know, this was happening at the time that Gaza was under complete attack by the Israeli military. Um, they took, the, I mean, they were fighting for their own lives, and yet they took the time via social media to reach out to the people in Ferguson and saying, you know, we no have heard that you're being tear gassed. We know what that's like. We've been tear gassed. And this is how you protect yourself from tear gas. Uh, this is how you protect yourself from uh, rubber bullets. Yeah, yeah. Well, there has to be unity among the people. Right. Well, right. I mean, that, that was amazing, the solidarity between the Palestinian people and the people in Ferguson. This, I'm going to add this on as a postscript because we, we, we didn't get into something, you know, that uh, T-shirt that said, Stay Human. Could you talk about that? Yes. Um, in, in connection with my attempts to go to, uh, to, go to Gaza, uh, I met uh, this young Italian man by the name of Vittorio Arigoni. Uh, we referred to him as Vic. And he was a, a dynamic person. And he, he arrived on, in Gaza on the first boat to Gaza in the summer, in August of 2008, and decided to stay in Gaza and work with the people there. And he was uh, almost like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. All the children there loved him and followed him around. Uh, and whenever he spoke to you and whenever he wrote to you, his last sentence always was, stay human, or in Italian, restiamo umani. And um, I, uh, I met him, the last time I met him was, I think it was in December of 2010, when we attempted to go to Gaza via land. I met him in Cairo, 
uh, in, there was a demonstration in front of the Israeli embassy. And I remember him saying to me, uh, because he realized or he knew that I had failed to get to Gaza uh, despite several earlier attempts. And I remember him saying to me, you know, if we can't get you to Gaza any other way, we have to catapult you into Gaza. <laughs> And unfortunately, in April of 2011, I think it was, he was kidnapped and murdered. Do they know who did this? Well, they were Palestinians who did it, but I suspect, although I have no proof of that, but I suspect this was at the behest of the Israelis. Gosh, gosh. It's a great loss to not only his family, but to humanity. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. You're welcome.